Thank you very much indeed, Professor Nier, and to your university uh, who have invited me and your president. It is a great honor to come to this Christian Women's University. I am ashamed to say that my own university of Cambridge gave degrees to women long after you could get such degrees in this university. It wasn't until 1948 that Cambridge gave full degrees to women. So, like many things, Japan is well in advance of the West and Cambridge. I'm going to talk quite slowly. Is this speed about right for you? Okay? Okay. So I will only be able to say a certain amount going quite slowly. But it is more important that you understand mostly what I say, and if I say many things, but you don't understand any of it. Okay? Some of you are smiling. I will try and make you laugh sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> then I know you are understanding. Um, I myself am an anthropologist and historian, as Professor Nia has told you, and after many years of being at a university in England, at Cambridge University, how many of you have been to England? Ah, quite a lot. Good. I hope you liked it. Yes. Um, you are too polite to say no. <laughs> um, did any of you have any of you been to Cambridge? Yes, just quite a lot. Well, I've taught there for many years, and I thought that at the end of this, like as an anthropologist goes to another society and understands and studies its customs and its culture and its history, so I would write a book which was like an anthropological or uh, sociological study of Cambridge University. And so this talk is based on a book which came out in England two weeks ago, at the beginning of this month, called Reflections on Cambridge. You can all buy it from Amazon if you want to, or you can tell your library to get a copy. Um, in it I try and stand back from my university and look at it from China or Japan or Nepal as if it was a foreign country and to understand what that kind of university is like. So I want to imagine I am like you, Japanese looking from the outside at a British university. What is it like? This is a British university, but it is not just any university. The university I am telling you about is the greatest university that has ever existed on this planet. Even greater than Oxford, where I was for 12 years. It is just having its 800th anniversary. It has been going for 800 years, which is not quite as long as Oxford. But the people who went to Cambridge, for one reason or another, are even more famous and important than went to Oxford. Cambridge has won more Nobel Prizes than all the universities in Britain combined together, twice as many as Oxford, twice as many as Harvard, twice as many as France, 
was one university. It has educated many of our greatest writers, poets, artists, historians, scientists. For example, in poetry, three quarters of the greatest poets who write English went to Cambridge, from Spencer, Milton, and John Donne up to Coleridge, Wordsworth, Tennyson, Byron. Hardly anyone went to Oxford, they all went to Cambridge. The only one who went to Oxford was Shelley, and he only went for one year before he was thrown out. It also has had many of the greatest scientists, starting with Francis Bacon and Newton to Charles Darwin and Stephen Hawking. So the question is, why has this university been so successful? Because I would like your university here, as it develops, to become a Cambridge of Japan. There is no reason why you shouldn't build and continue to build your university to be one of the great universities of the world. So what is it that is the secret of Cambridge? And you can see this, the story I am telling you here. This is the plan in my lecture. So I have now dealt with the, my introduction, Cambridge, uh, the contribution of Cambridge. And I'm now looking at what we think in the West is the thing that a university should do. And I would like you all the time to think to yourselves, do we do that here? Is that something which I had thought that a university should really be doing? Because I expect, I think, and I may hear from your questions, that you have a much smaller idea of what a university is than we attempt in Cambridge. The first thing a university should do, or one thing, is to develop our minds, our heads, to make us think. We all maybe think that's the case, and you accept that. Education. But we also believe that it is to make us feel our sentiments, our hearts, and also to behave in a certain way. We are taught in those years at university how you should feel about the world, and also how you should behave, how you should eat your food, how you should walk, how you should do all the things with your body as well as your mind, how you should laugh, laugh, how you should fall in love, how you should dance, how you should relax. All those things are being taught at the same time as your mind. You should also learn some social skills. That is to say, you should learn how to make friends, how to lose friends without being hurt, how to work with other people well so that you can join together and contribute, how to not be up too unhappy if you cannot succeed straight away, but to try again, how to be good members of the group. So what the university does for us is to make you into a new person. You have become one person in your home, and another in your school, and then you go to university and you are free to discover yourself. And as part of this, in our country, there is an emphasis on what we call your soul or your spirit. And talking in a Christian university, I think you will understand what I mean, that it is about something more than just in being clever or behaving.
behaving well or being with your friends. It is also something about your deeper spirit or soul. So education does not just mean teaching in classes like this. Very little of the uh, teaching in a place like Cambridge takes place in a, a lecture or with your teachers in a class. It occurs all round. It occur, occurs when you are dancing, when you are playing, when you are meeting with your friends and talking. In the, all the informal things, it is a whole way of life. And this happens in a special area. Your university is in a special area. When you come in here, you go out of the ordinary world and you come into a special place, which is set apart from Japanese society and in which you can behave and learn and think in ways which would be impossible if you were doing a job or outside. So those are the aims of our universities. So how many of you think you have understood almost all of what I have said so far? Can you put your hands up? How many of you would think that you have understood maybe half of what I have said so far? Put your hands up. How many of you think you have understood nothing of what I have said so far? Put your hand up. Okay. Most of you have understood maybe half and upwards. Maybe that is good enough. So, the question is, how can you do all those things? How do we perform this very difficult job of changing your minds, your hearts, your bodies, and your spirit, which we are trying to do. And also, how is it that this university, this ancient university, and Oxford and some other universities, have managed to go on doing this for a very long time? Your university is quite old, it is nearly a hundred years old now. But most universities are like yours, less than a hundred or a hundred years old. Cambridge is eight hundred years old. So how can you keep a place for eight hundred years still doing interesting things? The the first thing you need is um, political. That is to say, you have to stop people from destroying the university. This is the job of your president and your teachers. Nearly always, after a time, universities come under huge pressure from outside, either to completely change them, or to destroy them. All over my part of the world, in Europe, all the great universities of 800 years ago were shut or destroyed. By 200 years ago, the French universities, the Spanish universities, the Italian universities, German universities, all were destroyed. Likewise, in China, there were universities in the Song um, period, but they all were destroyed. Likewise, in um, Islamic civilizations, there were madrasas and things like universities, they were destroyed. It is amazing that these two institutions, Oxford and Cambridge, were never destroyed. 
And in my book, I explain how this happened. It was largely a matter of good fortune, knowing the right people, good connections, good, um, a good deal of money and wealth, and they managed to go on. But you can be destroyed from the outside when people say, we would like to have your money, we don't want you to think for yourselves. That often happens. But also, you can be destroyed from the inside. That happens because nearly always human beings, when they are in a group, they are quite wealthy, they are um, satisfied with what they are doing. Slowly, or quite quickly, they become very conservative. They don't want to change anything. They become what we call fossilized or frozen. So, nearly all institutions, and this happened to the Islamic institutions, it's happened recently in places like Germany. The German universities now are not very good because they have become frozen. And it's difficult to know how you prevent this normal tendency towards stopping anything developing. The way I think we have... Uh, there were periods in, in Cambridge when this happened. There were the whole of the 18th century was fairly conservative, as was Oxford. But somehow, each time it gets very closed and frozen, it breaks out again and it starts opening out. Maybe from a bit of pressure from the outside, but inside also. But on the whole, the university keeps renewing itself. Now one way, obviously, you could renew yourselves, if there is this danger up here, is to have outside influence, have more foreign students, for example, which I know Kale University wants to do. Looking at all of you, you are, I think, almost all Japanese. Are there any people from China? Yeah? I know. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else from China? Anyone from Vietnam? Korea? No. You see, all of you from here, except I'm going to the back. Um, so, bringing in new ideas and so on helps. But also, we have a system of internal politics, political power, which stops the thing becoming too rigid and frozen. And this is because we don't have all the power up at the top. We put the power down, lower down, and we have it in many places. We have many contradictions and conflicts of power between this part of the university and that part of the university, the colleges, which I'll explain, and the university. And that means that even if you have some people here who don't want to change anything, there are other people there who do, and they change things and then the others have to change too. One of our most famous um, graduates at Lundby was Charles Darwin, and we are celebrating the publication of The Origins of Species in Cambridge, 150th anniversary this year. And Cambridge is like a Darwinian system, an evolutionary system. It is constantly making very small adjustments because you have lots of competing forces and powers. And this one thinks of something new and does it. This one tries to block it, and this one wins. So you have what Darwin famously described, uh, or his friends described, as the survival of the fittest, the most fit. The, the best tends to win after a time. And the result is that there is a lot of independent freedom. I, over my 40 years, 
in Cambridge, I've always felt that I run my own life. No one tells me what to do. The Vice Chancellor and the university organization is a long way away. I decide my courses, I set my examinations, I have my relations with my student. I am responsible for my own life. And that gives me great freedom to experiment and to think and do what I feel is best. So it is not a, a top-down system, it's a very bottom-upward system. The second mechanism is the colleges. Now, it is very puzzling for people from other cultures and societies to understand what we mean by colleges. Even very clever French academics often ask us, we don't understand what your Cambridge College, what is this strange thing? So, very briefly, what I want to explain is the, the college system. I'll see whether you can hear me without this, um, so I can just draw something on the board. Can you hear me? Yes? Yes. Just about. Okay. Oh, right. They have all the modern technology you see. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, I'll just give you an example from my own college, King's College, Cambridge. So, you have a gate here, and you have grass. You know what grass is, stuff out like there. The grass is the most important part of the college because it separates those who are members of the college, senior members, from the rest of the world. My greatest joy and pleasure is that I can walk over that grass. <laughs> None of you can. If you are, if you try, you will be shooed off. So there's the grass. There's a river here, there's a building here, big white building, big building, there's a chapel here, there's a dining room here, there's a library here, there's student rooms here. There's a garden here. And playing fields where we play games here. Now, what that immediately shows you is that our college, when you are a member of the college as a student or a member of staff, you are uh, you are in a space which is like a tribe, like a family, like something more than just education. I have a room here, and in that I teach my students face to face, one to one, one to two. Um, and I go off and lecture here, in lecture rooms up there. But that is only a tiny part of it. This is a community which is, as I say, dealing with your head, your heart, and your body. Your heart and your spirit may be in the chapel, which is the most beautiful building in perhaps certainly one of the most beautiful buildings in England and, and in the world. Um, 
The fellows of the college live here you, in the past, not so much now, but you live inside the college. Both the teachers and the students lived inside the college. You go and read books in the library. You eat together. In the past, every teacher had to eat and student had to eat at least three times a week inside the dining room there. You go and walk around the garden and you play games in the playing field. And the students live, all our students live in college rooms right through their undergraduate course. So basically all the things you need to do, there's a, a student um, bar and a common room there, all the things of your different parts of your life during that time are within the college. So it's like a, a Chinese family or clan with its ancestor halls and its communal property and so on. Once you are a member of it, you become, certainly for the senior members, you change from one position outside to becoming inside. For example, you have to go through certain rituals. When I became a fellow of uh, King's College, I had to swear a particular oath that I would be, uh, do all the things the college wanted of me, to further the college as a place of education, religion, teaching, and research. And then I had to kneel down on my knees and the provost of the college, the head of the college, puts his hands on your head and admits you. It's a religious ritual. And after that, I can walk on grass and other things like that. So basically, you join a community. So the college is what is unique about Oxford and Cambridge. All the universities of the West more or less like Paris um, and the Italian Bologna and so on, had universities seven, eight hundred years ago. But they died out. Five hundred years later, there were no colleges in any of the universities. The nearest is the Sorbonne in Paris, but that is different in certain ways. So they faded away all over. And when Cambridge founded Harvard, that's to say, all the first teachers and John Harvard himself um, went to America, they tried to take this college system to America, but it didn't really work there. So there's only these two colleges, and to a certain extent, one or two other English universities. But again, if I was thinking about what um, would make this, this particular university special. I think emphasizing the multidimensional, the many different functions and roles, and trying to encourage a, a sense of the community, which having colleges, rather like in schools, they have different houses. Now, I will probably prepare from you that you do have colleges. And I'll tell you what you already have, I don't know. But I suspect you don't have it very much developed in it. It is what is very important about Cambridge. The nearest you have in, in uh, Japan, I think, is the IE system. How many of you know about the IE system in Japan? None. I'm ashamed of you. This might be nice How many of you know this wasn't been written on the board yet? Still, there will be one or two. <laughs> I, will, I won't uh, describe it to you now, but you do have historically a system which is quite like a college, where you are, you are all family members 
and we work together um, like a college. Um, in such a, a college, um, your sense of belonging as a student is strengthened by various things. For instance, you have lots of games and sports against other colleges. So you go and you cheer for your college against other colleges. You wear special ties, costumes, um, you have a flag, and you eat and you drink together. And you say, when you ask someone, you say, which college are you from? Um, and it is in the college, particularly, that the intensive life outside formal teaching, you will go to a class like this, then you will go back to your college, and you will have supper or lunch with someone, or go out for a drink, and there you will discuss things. Cambridge is largely about conversation, talking, 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 learning through talking, and talking takes place a lot in the colleges. But it isn't just the colleges that are important, because there are many things that people may want to do which can't really be done within one college. So we have many, many clubs and associations which our students join. In my, we have a, a university diary. This is this year's diary. Do you have a diary for your university? Yes? Okay. Well, maybe with one or two of you, I can compare our diaries, which would be very interesting to see what you have in your diaries. Um, and one of the things we have in our diaries is a list of all the societies that there are present in the university that you can join. It doesn't list all of them, but it has some of them. If you go to the website of the university and look at the list of societies, there are hundreds and hundreds. Just under the letter S, there are over 60 different societies in Cambridge, um, which encourage you to do anything like the Society for Skateboarding, um, the Shakespeare Society, um, and so on and so on. Acting, um, music, games, hobbies, all these are very, very important. How many of you are members of societies and clubs in this university? If you are a member of one, at least one society or club. Put your hand up. You understand? A society or a club? You understand? Okay, put your hand up. One. More than five. Now, if this was a... I mean, if there were only five of you, you put your hand up. Did you understand the question at the back? The ones at the back there, did you understand the question? No sign of life. <laughs> um, anyway, it's a very, very, I mean, if you had asked this of a Cambridge student audience, all of them would have said at least one, and many of them would have said four, five, six. Because the university in Cambridge, in many ways, is a place for learning what you are good at, what you enjoy doing. You might enjoy games and sport, you'd be good at that. You may be good at music, you may be good at acting, you may join the Cambridge Union, which is a political society. You are learning what it is that you are going to do in the rest of your life through these societies and associations. They are just as important for your later life as the teaching that you get because you meet other people with similar interests. You discover that you really love um, scuba diving or chess or financial matters or whatever through these societies or filmmaking or whatever. So you have these um, colleges clubs and associations, and of course you have what you must have here, 
departments and faculties and so on, and the group all of them, which where the teaching and so on is done. So many, many different types of organization to which you belong. Another effect um, uh, that's clubs and departments. Another effect is uh, the buildings and the beauty. Um, your president was telling us that you have only just opened this building and made this very nice area out here. We are, as human beings, very deeply influenced by the world in which we, which we inhabit. This very nice lecture hall, for example, it makes a difference for me as lecturer and you as listeners. And having beautiful places to walk around um, makes a huge difference. So Cambridge, with its many ancient buildings, walks, river, trees, gardens, inspires. This, I think, is one of the reasons we have had many great poets came through Cambridge. They were inspired. And many of our scientists also, you might think it's something just for poets, but many um, of our scientists also had their great ideas walking around the quadrangles, as we call them, um, or courts of Cambridge and the rivers and the banks and so on. But of course, um, part of the heart of all this is the, te the teaching methods. Um, to teach people to think for themselves, to have their own ideas, to question the world, is quite unusual. You may think it's obvious that that's what the university is trying to do. But in most societies, or most of the time, the idea has, to, has been to stop people thinking. If they think for themselves, they will question. And if they question, those who are in power may find it difficult to retain their power. So the idea in the Confucian educational system, which has had a great influence, obviously, on Japan as well, is to stop you thinking. By that I mean it teaches you the tools of memory, the tools of writing, the tools of logic to a certain extent, but not to think for yourself. So you repeat the wisdom of the ancestors. You learn the received wisdom, but you don't challenge it. One central feature of universities, as they are thought of in the West and in Cambridge, is that they are places to teach you to challenge and um, have your own thoughts. This comes from Greek thought, from methods of Socrates. That's why I put um, the Socratic method. The Socratic method was method of putting a question and then letting someone answer and then challenging their answer and making them think again and backwards and forwards like this. This method, which was developed by the Greeks, was brought down from the Greeks to the medieval universities. And in England particularly, it was joined with a um, system taken from law courts. Law is very important in England. And in law, what you do in English law is you argue. You have someone who is trying to defend themselves and someone who is trying to attack them. That is the basis of English law. Attack and defense, attack and defense, attack and defense. Same principle as our games. The same thing. Law is a kind of game. And the pursuit of truth is also a kind of game. So the center of my teaching system, and you'll have to think whether this is true of you as well, is that when my students come to see me, 
Incidentally, if you want to hear this all elaborated further, if you go to my YouTube site, Ayavaya, or my website, there is a tour around Cambridge where I talk about the teaching methods and the colleges actually there and pointing at the buildings. There I explain our teaching method. My teaching method would be that if I were teaching an interview, I would, you would come and see me and say, I am going to be taught by you this term. And there would be two of you, just two of you, or maybe one, sometimes three. And I'd say, well, this week, I think you should try and solve the following problem. Why do human beings kill each other? Why is there so much war? That is your problem for me. Or why do human, why do Western societies base their marriages on love? And societies in Eastern Asia have arranged marriages where their parents arrange them. That is your question. Here are some suggested books and articles. Go away for a week and come back with your opinion and your views and your essay and the argument. So they come back and then we sit down for an hour and they say, I think people will kill each other because we are biologically like that. And then I say, so how would you explain the fact that there are some societies, small societies living in the jungle, who are very peaceful, who never kill anyone? If it is biological, why don't they do it as well? And then they think, and they say, well, maybe those societies used to kill each other, and then they discovered it because they were so small, and so on. And then I say, so you have a, an argument, a gentle backwards forward, like playing tennis. They play the ball to me, I play the ball back to them, they play the ball to me, and so on. And after an hour or so, hopefully, both of us have modified our position, learned a little more, learned how to persuade the other, learned what are good arguments and bad arguments. And that is the basis of the, what is called the supervision system, which is more or less unique to Oxford and Cambridge, though it is found a little bit in other universities. And it is a very good way of getting to know students individually and for them to develop their reasoning and their argument. And this is based on the idea that we should encourage them to um, question everything. They should be like Western children. I don't know if Japanese children are like this, but Western children are always curious and asking why, why, why. They say, Daddy, why, why does the sun go up in the sky? Why does it come up? And you say, that's because the earth is turning round. So, why does the earth turn round? Well, that's because of the laws of gravity. Why are there the laws of gravity? And so you go on. Why, why, why? And students should be like that. So whatever the common opinion is, we, we in Cambridge would much prefer a student to make a mistake, to risk a new opinion, to question something, rather than to just repeat the boring facts which they have accumulated or they've read in books. Uh, we don't really, many universities have a problem now of the internet. How many of you, and you, perhaps it's difficult for you to be honest, how many of you get your essays and a lot of your work from the internet? <laughs> Certainly one brave person has put their hand up, so I expect there are others here. Um, of course, some of our students do a bit, but they don't do it much because 
the kind of questions they're set. You can't just go to an internet and take an essay off. And also, they realize, I think, that there is no point. Because when they go into the examinations, they sit at a desk and they can't use any other, um, the, the internet and so on. They're going to have to think and be original for themselves. So it's better to learn how to do that without relying on the internet. So basically you think for yourself. You think absurd things, you think original things. You try to invent new things. Now, that kind of way of approaching the world means that when you go out from Cambridge, when you become a poet like Coleridge or Wordsworth or Byron, you try new poetic forms. When you become a scientist, when you become a politician, you're always trying to think of ingenious, clever ways of getting around solving problems, not just taking the simple approach. And this is meant to help you through your life. Now, it may be that one of the reasons why the um, it's very difficult for you to do this is that you can't really argue with your teachers. How many of you would find it difficult to argue with your teachers? The same brave person who is using the internet finds it difficult to argue with her teacher, but I'm sure some others of you also would find that difficult. If your teacher says something to you, would it be possible for you to say, no, I don't think that's right? Yeah. Would it be possible? No, not really. Um, you have to have a very, quite an equal relationship. Slightly unequal, because if you just think that your teacher is just the same as you, and knows nothing more than you, then um, it's no good. But it, you have to have um, enough equality and enough trust in each other to be able to discuss. If you have what is known as the vertical society, which was maybe famously described by Nakanichi, um, then superior and inferior, then it's too unequal and your teacher becomes just the, the sensei and just teaches you. So, for various reasons in Cambridge. My students now refer to me by my name, Alan. And I talk to them more or less during that time as my equals. Younger, but not less intelligent, not less worthwhile, not inferior in any way, and just discuss matters with them to try and help them. I am older, I know a little more, but they one day will perhaps be richer, more powerful, more famous than me. Just at the moment, they are younger. And so for that time, I have the opportunity to teach them. So, um, we have a um, conversational equality. And the last um, main point I want to make is that we have a logical mental system and a language system which encourages a kind of teaching, which I think is difficult in Japan. Um, in in uh, medieval English universities, one of the main things that was taught was logic. The ability to argue along a chain of ideas. This was taught, the ideas of what causes another thing. And we have very strong rules of logic in the West. For example, a very strong rule is that um, what we call the syllogism, which is um, C, then A equals C, you can 
log logically argue like this. Now, that, so some people think, it's not so widely accepted in Chinese culture, and I don't know about Japanese culture. Um, you'll have to tell me afterwards. Um, also, our system of teaching in our world is based very much on what we call the experimental method. The experimental method is that you have an idea, then you go out and you test it in the world around you. You think, ah, I noticed that this apple fell on my head. Um, which certain Cambridge man called Newton noticed when an apple fell on his head, so there was a more fell on the ground. He thought, ah, maybe there is a force pushing the apple down. Supposing I experiment with that and I take an apple and I take something slightly lighter and I throw them off the top of Trinity College um, Library. Do they hit the ground at the same time? Uh, what is the relationship between force, weight, gravity and all these other things? So you experiment. And um, experiments are central to Western thought, not just in the sciences. They're there. Another Cambridge person, Francis Bacon, um, wrote famously about the experimental method in science. But it, it's important everywhere. But it's based on an idea that, which is not so strong in Japan. China, which is that the world out there is real and unchanging. That we as human beings, if you, if all of us looked at the same thing, we would all see the same thing. Our eyes all see the same facts. And that if you do an experiment now and you do another one in a week's time or a month's time, then the results will be the same. Now in many cultures, the world is filled with all sorts of powers and forces and magic and spirits and karma and uh, so on. And therefore, it's unstable. You can't repeat experiments and be certain that you will get the same results and deduce something from that. So it's much more difficult to have experiments. Now I think in Japanese science, which is now of course very successful and distinguished, you, do, you are part of the world which believes that you could do experiments and they could be repeated. But much of Japanese thought and Chinese thought over the long centuries has been in a world that is so what we call contextual, so much based on your own opinion and views. It's a world where truth is relative to your relationship. If someone in power tells you this is true, then it is true. Have any of you heard of 1984 by George Orwell? Yes, one or two. Well, Part of that is about his famous, the, the big brother is trying to force him into a position where he will accept that two and two equals five. He knows that two and two equals four, but the powers around him are trying to persuade him. Once they have broken his will so that he will say two and two equals five, then he's lost. Now, I think in Japan and China, Two and two is whatever someone tells me it is. And if they tell me it's five, then it's five. Um, so truth is relative to the situation. And that isn't a good basis for science. We believe that God created our world. And maybe in a Christian university, truth is much more firm. Because once God has created all the rules of life, then they are fixed. 
the alternative this. How many of you know of the films of Kurosawa? The great Japanese filmmaker Kurosawa, Rashomon. Have any of you heard of Rashomon? Some. Well, the, the famous, if you want to see a relative view of the world, then it is great film Rashomon shows you this, where you see a certain event, a set of events, a murder, through the eyes of five different people. And they all see a different set of events. We like to believe that if there were five English people, we would all see the same thing. So to, to finish off, we believe that the university is really about becoming a creative and curious and excited human being, exploring. This is the beginning of your life's exploration. You have come out of a quite a closed world of your school and your family. And now for the first time, you can explore in lots of directions. It gives you the self-confidence and some of the tools to explore the world in a new way. Whether you are a painter, a filmmaker, a politician, anything. And so if, if at the end of your three years you have lost your curiosity, which you have probably brought, then it's a waste of time. You should go out more curious than you came in. You should be prepared to take more risks because you now have some experience and you have learned that how you can have success. But you should also have an interest not just in very abstract things of the mind, but the relationship between those and the practical world. One great feature of many of the the Cambridge uh, scientists, was that they liked using their hands, making things. For example, Newton, um, he needed very good lenses for his telescopes and his experiments, and he did that himself, he ground his own lenses. Crick and Watson, who discovered um, the secret of life, DNA, in made the DNA model themselves. Rutherford uh, at Cambridge, who split the atom for the first time, made the equipment for that experiment themselves. So we like to do things with our hands. I tinker around with computers, with cameras, with YouTube, with Facebook, with Twitter, with um, all these things, because we want to both think and do. Some of you may know Karl Marx's famous remark that the job of the philosopher is not to understand the world, but to change the world. Why we think Karl Marx was rather oversimple, perhaps a bit childish, is that of course our job is both to understand the world and to change the world. How can you change the world if you don't understand the world? So, with those thoughts and the possibility that if anything I've said interests you, and if you want to see this lecture, if my wife is, is kindly filming it, has managed to succeed, I will put this lecture up onto YouTube in a few months, and you can see it again if you want to, or better, or other lectures. So, with that, I'd like to thank you very much for paying attention. I can see that many of you work too hard, that you're very tired, particularly after lunch, and you're dealing with a, another language. So I'm very uh, honored that you have mostly kept awake and hopefully understood some of what I, if not all of what I said. Thank you very much indeed.